What's poppin', y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Heliocentric Podcast. I'm your host, Pierre, Pee Wee the Plug Andreessen. Happy Monday to everybody around the world. First thing first, everybody on YouTube that's watching, make sure you hit that like button for me. And if you're new and you enjoy this type of content, make sure you subscribe. And for my audio listeners, wherever you listen to your podcast, head over to that platform and leave this podcast a five-star like and review. It is always much appreciated. For my basketball fans, we have a lot in store. We feel like kids and candy stores for everybody who just enjoys basketball. I'm very aware that there are a lot of people who just simply enjoy NBA basketball. They want to see the professionals at the highest level at all times. They have no other interest, nothing more, nothing less. But there are people like me who enjoy all type of forms of basketball, whether it's women's basketball, the WNBA, the, the, the women's tournament, the men's co- uh, college basketball, high school basketball, youth basketball, EuroLeague, whatever we can watch. As long as it's good, productive basketball, we enjoy watching it. So for people like me who enjoy all type of basketball, right now is just a great time to be a basketball fan. Tonight, we got LSU against Iowa, the rematch, Andrew Reese against Kalen Clark. We understand Kalen Clark is America's sweetheart in, in, in the women's basketball world and LSU um, everybody just has something bad to say, and they're taking on that that bad girl type of mentality from the coach. And we getting articles being written about them, the different things being said. So they 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 taking that and putting that chip on their shoulder, and they coming out and battling. And then you have Kalen Clark, who's just been absolutely phenomenal. We know about that. And then tonight we also have USC against UConn, which is Juju Watkins against Paige Buckers. So. That's going to be probably my, my favorite one. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to more so the UConn versus USC um, and see that guard head-to-head matchup. You got the freshman against Paige, who's overcome some injuries and different things like that. Um, I'm very excited for that. And then Saturday, we have the men's Final Four, which is going to be NC State against Purdue. And then also, we have UConn against Alabama. If you know me, you know I've talked so highly about Nate Oates at Alabama. I'm just one of my favorite college coaches, if not my favorite college coach. Love what he does at Alabama. I love the offense they play with. Right now in a tournament, the defense has started to click. Obviously, that's how they got this far. And then more specifically, though, you got to talk about NC State and UConn. Like, NC State is why we love March. They are the Cinderella team in this, I believe, UConn and Purdue are both number one seeds, and you have Alabama, who's the number four seed. So you got three top five or top four seeds, and then you have an 11 seed who barely got into the tournament. Like, for those of you that don't know, the only reason NC State got into the tournament is because they won their conference tournament, right? So you got to understand, in college basketball, you have the NCAA tournament, which is the big hoorah. That's the, that's the, that's the big thing. That's the big dance. But before the the NCAA tournament, you have conference tournaments. Every college is in a conference, just like the NBA has divisions or whatever. So you have the ACC, the Big East, the Pac-12, the the Big Ten, Big 12, um, the A-10. You have the Mountain West. You have uh, the Ivy League, like the Horizon. There's so many different conferences. There's, There's a bunch. At the end of every season, after conference play, which is where you just play it, the, the last half of your schedule, you're going to play different teams in your conference. It's all conference. And I think that's really because of a, a, a scheduling and a, a mapping out where you're playing all the teams around you. Because mostly the teams in your conference, y'all are all in the same parameter. You, you get what I'm saying? Until, I guess, in the next year, you'll start to have Big Ten teams merging with Pac-12 teams. So you'll have a UCLA and a USC playing against an Illinois that, that's going to be, you know, a little interesting to see. But for the most part, Duke and North Carolina are both North Carolina schools. NC State is a North Carolina school. They're all in that region of each other. So when it's conference play, you're just playing against all of these teams in your parameter, really. When then after that, you have teams going to a tournament of, of that conference. And you'll have the seeding based off how you played against the opponents in your conference. And then after the conference tournament, you go to the NCAA tournament and you have certain teams who are automatic bidders. So if you're a top 25 team, you're probably automatically going into the NCAA tournament. If you're a really good team, you're automatically going. There are certain teams like NC State who had a rocky year 
but they played extremely well in conference play. If you win your conference tournament, you automatically go to the NCAA tournament. I don't give a damn if you won one game the entire season. You you can go 1-27 in in the entire year, but then you get hot in the conference tournament play and you win it all, you automatically go to the NCAA tournament. That's the story with NC State. NC State won the conference tournament. They beat Duke. They beat North Carolina. And then they beat Virginia in the championship game. And if you remember, Virginia was up three, went to the free throw line. They make that free throw. It's a four-point play with five seconds left, a four-point game with five seconds left. They probably close it out. They missed the free throw. Obviously, you know the rest of the story because NC State is here. But, like, if NC State goes to the championship or wins the championship or even the fact that they're in the Final Four, five years from now, people are probably going to make videos about this run because they are literally a team who probably don't make it. Like, they, they there's they are free throw away from not even making a tournament at all. If, if Virginia makes that free throw, Virginia goes to the tournament automatically, and we saw how they played in their play-in game to get into the tournament. Just offense non-existent. So this story is kind of crazy and beautiful. Obviously, DJ Burns, DJ Horn, phenomenal. Um, this is like their coach probably, I I, I don't know, I, who knows? I, they always say hot seat or potentially could have been fired. Who knows? But um, it's just an incredible story, and it's why college basketball is so phenomenal. So I'm kind of actually rooting for NC State to win the championship. My pick when I made my bracket was UConn. And like I've said, I'm a big Nate Oates fan, and um, I want to see him get a ring probably with Alabama. But this Final Four is even more special. Um. So I'm rooting for NC State just because, like, man, this is the type of stuff that gets people into college basketball. A team that barely made it, a free throw away from not making it. They make it, and then they continue to just go on a, a surge. Like, this is what March is all about. So um, just wanted to start off the podcast with that. Like, just in general, as basketball fans, we have so much to tap into. So tonight, if you're not really feeling the NBA slate or you just want to just be, be caught up in the hype as well, Do not forget, we got two main games, like two headlines. There's more than two games, the Elite Eight right now on the women's side of the bracket. But these two headlines and two matchups are must-see TV, if you ask me. But again, Paige against Juju, Angel Reese, Kaylin Clark, LSU, Iowa, UConn, USC. I'll be tuning into that. And then Saturday, we got a big gap. We got a bunch of days. But Saturday is the men's Final Four, and then we'll have the men's national championship game next Monday, which is going to be um, a sight to see. Now, for the NBA, our our, our, ma- our main thing, the league is on fire as well in the NBA. Like, the, the NBA is going crazy right now. I feel like every day there's something new to talk about or there's a new storyline, um, something that I didn't talk about on this podcast because I think it came out after I did the podcast last week. The Jante Porter thing, obviously the betting and the gambling. Um, If you want to see me really dive in on that, ESPN took a clip of the numbers on the board um, podcast where I talked about it in depthly. That has been doing really well on ESPN's YouTube um, where they basically took out the segment and just 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 showed me go in on the topic just just for a a few a, a few moments. My whole thing is just like for me. And again, you'll you'll see me really go in depth and speak on it on in that video specifically. But I'm I'm a basketball person to my core. Like this is my life. This is what I do. So I'm very I'm very understanding of, of everything that comes with it. You know what I mean? Like I know a lot because I've just dove into it and made it me. And so when I see things like that, it strikes a nerve in me because it's bigger than basketball. I'm a guy who I, I never even played. I, I wasn't a McDonald American. I didn't go to a Division One school. I didn't play at North Carolina or Duke. I didn't even I didn't play at Michigan State or Minnesota or anything like that. But it's still a part of me because it's like it's 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 my life. Before I was playing as a kid, I was into it. When I started playing, I was into it. After I played, I was into it. Uh, when I tore a tendon in my ankle in high school. When I was really at my peak of powers as a basketball player, I was into it. Like, this is always going to be me. Now, even these days, I don't even play as much because I'm so busy. It's still my life. It pays my bills. It's what people know me from. Majority of the people in the world that know me on a personal level or just know me from knowing me is from basketball. It's been my entire life. So when I see certain things like this, it strikes a nerve because 
I understand the privilege that comes with playing basketball in general, number one, but then also being able to play at the NBA level. It's a legitimate privilege to be able to have that. It's a lot of guys I know personally and from afar who have the talent and skill set to have played in the NBA. But because their body failed them, the environments they come from, the people that they had surrounding them, they weren't able to have the privilege of playing at a high level in the NBA. Y'all know the stories better, just like I do. Y'all seen Greg Oden. They call Greg Oden a bus. I don't know how Greg Oden is a bus. He's a bus because his, his, his body failed him. I don't think Greg Oden wanted bad knees. You know what I mean? Isaiah Austin from Baylor. I don't think Isaiah Austin wanted the health conditions that that ruled him to not be able to play in the NBA. I don't think Chris Bosh wanted the blood clot stuff that stopped his NBA career kind of early, even though he had a wonderful career. Thank goodness we, it wasn't shut, cut too short. But when that happened to Chris Bosh, he still had a lot of basketball he wanted to play. You know what I mean? Go look at the Lenny Cook stories, the Sebastian Telfair stories. There are so many different stories about different people who they did make it to the NBA, but they just didn't have the certain privilege of having a long career or the career that they wanted. And it was because of, of a bunch of different things. But when you have somebody in the NBA like John Say Porter, who's throwing it all the way because they're betting on themselves to be bad. It's just it's just baffling to me. It's just baffling to me. And then if you go to any state, any big city, every big city or even small city, every city is going to have a, a guy who was that dude who didn't get that chance. Go around. I'm, I'm, I'm from Chicago. We have plenty of those. You, you, y'all know the Benji Wilson story. A guy who was probably going to be an NBA player but got shot and killed. Y'all know that story. But I, I'm not blind or ignorant enough to think that there's not a, the same type of story uh, in somewhere else in the world. I'm sure there's a Houston, there's a Houston Hooper. You know what I mean? Like, like there's somebody in, yeah, in Houston that's just like, that was the guy. He was our, he was the one. But this happened. You know what I mean? The, the streets caught him. You know what I mean? He got wrapped up in some street shit. I have a cousin who was a lot older than me, but you know, before my time. But he was the dude. He was a dude in Chicago. And. You know, he he got caught up in some street shit and he got he got shot and that kind of derailed him. So it, it happens. And I know everybody who's tapped in enough knows somebody or knows a story that's like that. So when I see shit like that, it's just like, man, come on, man. You was in a situation where you come from, from what I know, a nice structured family, because I've kept up with a family for a while because Michael Porter Jr. was one of the most polished and decorated high school basketball players of his time. And. You know, their their dad has coached in college and, you know, was on the Mizzou staff when they went to Mizzou and they have sisters and other siblings who have played all type of sports in Division One. Their family is extremely decorated when it comes to sports. You know, they they they, they have a legendary family. So um, I followed I followed them and their upbringing. And, and from what I've seen, because I don't know directly, but from what I'm seeing. They they seem to ha have had their shit together and, and had some structure there to where. This is kind of baffling. Even when you look at his brother, on the type of contract he is, and I'm not saying his brother's just gonna pay for his life. I think that's a misconception around, around like the world where like if you have somebody in a good spot, it's like, man, why would you do that? Your brother got money. It's like his, his brother's his own man, which I understand. But even the salary that, and the money that you were making from just your plan, it, when you're able to pay your bills and sustain a life in in this world, in this world that we're seeing right now off of basketball, a kid's game, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Even if you're not making a, a $20 million contract, if you are just able to say, hey, I have rent, I have a car or a car note, and I like some nice shit, and I'm able to afford that off of playing NBA basketball professionally or overseas, wherever, it's a blessing. It's a lot. Of, it's, it's hard out here. For the, for the regular 9 to 5 person, it is extremely hard out here. So for people to throw shit like that away, um because they want to gamble and be greedy it's it's tough it's tough for me to watch we see people do dumb shit all the time because they're just not good people and that's one thing but like greed is kind of mind-blowing because it's like you are you're in a good spot you you're in a good spot things are going well for you in the grand scheme of things but your greed is going to let you fuck it all up just simply having greed and then the, the last thing that i'll say on it is like you're betting on yourself to be bad. 
that's the part that I think I, I it's really hard for me to grasp. I'm such a basketball guy and such a sports guy because I love baseball as well. I like football too. I like golf because of the competitive nature. I still play 2K at 29 years old a lot because it just it, it it's another outlet for me to tap into my competitiveness. And it's like I can't fathom someone betting on themselves to be bad. It's one thing to bet, but it's a whole other thing to bet on yourself to be ass. I'm betting the under on myself. They are saying I'm going to score four and a half points and I'm going to make sure that I only score two. I'm missing shots on purpose. I'm letting somebody score on me on purpose. I'm faking injuries. I always have respect for Pete Rose and I hate that the MLB has banned, you know, banned him and did all that shit. Won't let him in in a Hall of Fame. But at least Pete Rose was betting on himself and his team to win. Pete Rose was not betting, oh, I'm going to strike out three times. Watch this. And I'm going out and just swinging at anything. No, Pete Rose was saying, hey, we win it. Damn it. And I think that's a lot more respectable when you think about the competitive nature that comes with these sports than to just say, I'm going to be ass and I'm going to lose on purpose out of the sake of fucking greed. The amount of effort and energy you put into that, you could have put into working on your damn game and maybe would have got yourself a long term contract because the, ra- the, the Raptors saw something in you. The Raptors saw something in him because it blew my mind when he was on the Grizzlies and then got a, another chance with the Raptors. Because based off what I had seen from him at the pro level, it was it had it hadn't been much, and he always had a nice game. But um, again, at the pro level, dealing with the injuries that he had, he had a knee injury. It was just tough for me to imagine him coming back. And when I was seeing him get his shots, I'm like, okay, Jonte, okay, okay, okay. And then you throw it away for this bullshit. So that's my two cents on that. It just crossed my mind that I didn't get the chance to speak on it um, outside of that. Um, Other things around the NBA that we'll talk about real quickly before we get into the meat and potatoes of the show, which is going to be extremely interesting. And I can't wait to see y'all opinions and reactions and and, and everything that y'all have to say in the comments to the the main part. Um, Embiid. Joel Embiid is rumored to be making his return sometime this week, potentially tomorrow, Tuesday, which would be phenomenal. Um, this is going to be amazing. I, I think the Philadelphia 76ers obviously need this. The NBA needs it. I was a big, big believer that, hey, I'm skeptical of him returning at the start of the playoffs. Obviously, this is extremely close to the start of the playoffs, but it's not, hey, the first time we see Joel Embiid is game one of the playoffs or shit, now that they fail, the play in. I think they have, what, eight, nine, ten games left. This is a good cushion to get them in slowly. Start to have him get some real live game reps under his belt. You can do the minutes restriction or whatever. Start to try to let him get his win back under him. Get the team reacclimated to playing with him and having him on the floor because it's been a while. Um, and I think you can ease your way into that and start to ramp it up the last three, two games of the season. And then, boom, you jump into the play in and now he's ready. He don't really have to knock the rust off in the midst of trying to make the playoffs. He has a good nine, eight games now to knock that rust off, build that win back up, and then he'll be ready for the play-in for y'all to make a playoff push. And as an eighth seed, as a seventh seed out east, as a play-in team, bringing in Joel Embiid, that makes it extremely dangerous for the top teams. It makes it completely dangerous. I'm not saying that they're going to beat the Celtics. I'm not saying that they're going to beat the Bucs. I'm just saying it makes it completely dangerous. As a number one seed, as a number two seed, the last thing I want to see is Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid across from me as my reward from dominating the entire year. The Celtics have dominated the entire year. It would be a hell of a reward to say, hey, here, since you were so good in the first round, here's Joel Embiid. They might still win. They'll still be the favorite. But they're going to have to exhort a lot of energy in stopping Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. And usually when you have that first seed, the first round is supposed to, quote unquote, be kind of a buy. Something you can kind of ease through, get you ready. But you don't want to fight too hard. You don't want to have to bruise and bang. You don't have to go six games. You don't have to do anything like that. It's supposed to be a four to five game series. Then you're able to rest, relax. And get ready for the next round. The Philadelphia 76ers, they could beat up the, the, the Celtics or the Milwaukee Bucks. They, they might lose, but they'll still beat them up and make them a little bit more banged and bruised going into the second round, which is exactly what you want to escape if you're a top two seed. So I'm excited for the return of Joel Embiid. 
Um, I wish we could have had him for the full season because the MVP race is going to be phenomenal. Shea Gilders Alexander last night with the game winner over my Knicks. He's obviously in the running. Um, right now, I think I would have him either third or fourth. Him and Giannis third or fourth. That top two in this last stretch of games is really coming down to Jokic and, and, and Luka. The Mavericks right now, which we'll talk about, seven-game winning streak. We're seeing what Luka is doing. He's dominating. Um, Jokic, the Nuggets at the number two seed, they're, he's dominating in every game. I mean, he's having double-doubles, damn near triple-doubles in the first half of games. Same thing with Luka, but from a center perspective, it's just mind-blowing the dominance that Jokic continues to have on his on these games. But for the for the Mavericks to be as red hot as they are and for Luka to look as unstoppable as he's looked, I mean, I just I, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm kind of hoping they they move up a little bit more in the playoffs. I like the Clippers. I would love the Clippers to be able to get a home court advantage. But man, Luka has just been he's been arguably the best player in NBA. It's really a toss up between him and Jokic. You want to respect it, it's no disrespect to Jokic. You want to respect Jokic, but this is the Luka we've all been waiting for where the wins are equating the play and everything is kind of just lining up and going so well for him. And it feels like he has the best mesh of talent on his team that complements him and how he wants to play. And um, they're thriving. They're clicking and thriving at the right time. Like I said, we'll talk about them. We're going to, they're, they're on my list of scariest teams heading into the NBA playoffs. Um, and I'm just I'm just in awe, and I'm kind of pushing for him to win that MVP. No voters fatigue. No voters fatigue at all because I don't mind if Joker wins it either. But it just feels like Luka is on some new shit right now. Um Sabonis, real quick, I read this before I started. Sabonis is one of four players since 1980 to record 70 or more double-doubles in a season. 70 or more. When you think about some of the centers and the bigs that have played in the last couple of decades, the, the Dwight Howards, the hell, the Nikola Jokic's, the Joel Embiid's, it's been some monsters, Right. It's been some monsters and it's been some really good ba just basketball player. Marcus Gasol probably ain't the first person that comes to y'all name. Really good basketball. Paul Gasol, really good basketball player. You know what I'm saying? Like really, really good, good players. Joe Kim Noah, really good player. Even guys that aren't bigs, guards who are double, double machines. You know what I mean? Like Russell Westbrook when he was averaging a triple double. But Sabonis. Joins a list of, of, of guys who've got 70 or more double-doubles, and it's only four of them since 1980. KG in 2003-2004, which might have been his MVP year, he had 71 double-doubles. Hakeem Olajuwon in 1992-1993 season had 72 double-doubles. And Moses Malone, y'all, Moses Malone did this shit three times. He had 73 double-doubles in 1982-1983, 71 in 1981-1982, and then 74 double-doubles in 1980-1981. That's the type of company that the Monte Sabonis is joining. He's joining elite company. Moses Malone, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Kevin Garnett, specifically the Kevin Garnett MVP year. We're not talking about the Monte Sabonis enough. This is a dude that didn't make the playoff. I mean, that didn't make the All Star game. His team currently, right now, is in the play in. Uh, they would be playing against the, the the Suns if it started today. We have to put some respect on Demonte Sabonis, and this is why I think the NBA is really at its its peak. Not, I don't want to say peak. Excuse me. That that is not the right word to use. But we're really going into an era where the talent is just like amazing. You have a team like the Boston Celtics who theoretically have a five five all-star star lineup. You have a team in the Phoenix Suns who have three all-star caliber players, two all-NBA guys, two top two guys who are top five, top two in their position, and Kevin Durant and Devin Booker on one team. You have the Lakers who have an all-time great LeBron matched up with Anthony Davis. You have Joel Embiid and, and Maxie on the Philadelphia 76ers. You have Dame and Giannis, one of the greatest perimeter threats uh, in, in recent memory, one of the best interior threats in recent memory on one team. You have the Knicks as a four seed with Jalen Brunson, a guy who was um, a three-year player, second-round pick, a backup, came off the bench with the Mavericks, got thrown a bunch of money, and now is one of the best guards in the NBA, leading the Knicks uh, just had a 60-point performance. You got the Spurs with Vic Wimbiyama. You got Zion and Ingram and McCullum with Herb Jones and his perimeter defense. You have Kawhi, Russ, Harden, and PG on one team. Like, 
I, the Thunder with all of the young, they got like a big five with young talent of Shea, Will, uh, Jada, Chet. Like the NBA is just exploding with talent right now. It's just magnificent. I didn't even talk about the Nuggets, the reigning champs with Jokic and the perfect, the perfect surrounding four of Jamal Murray on ball, off ball threat who can mesh well with him in a pick and roll or the handoff, whatever. You have one of the best cutters and Aaron Gordon who does a lot defensively and all of the winning plays that they need. You have MPJ, a 6'10 sharpshooter and KCP, a sharp, a two way sharpshooter who like just these teams are magnificent. All around the board, around the league, there's teams I didn't even mention. Like the NBA is incredibly, incredibly just just overloading with talent right now, all around the board. Like, and a guy like Sabonis has 70 double doubles. 70. He's joining a list of players that are Hall of Famers, and he didn't even make an all-star game. He rarely gets talked about. He rarely gets talked about. These he this is the shit that has to come up for him to get talked about. But on a night and night basis. People aren't talking about Sabonis. And I don't want to make it seem like he's the most disrespected player in the NBA, but I'm just saying, like, from a social media standpoint, when I'm joining meetings and we're talking about different topics or things, nobody is saying, hey, let's make, let's talk about Sabonis. Like, I wish I could just pull up or I'm going to just do it live on air, live on a podcast for my audio listeners. I just pulled out my phone. I just want to go and I'm just going, I'm just going into YouTube and I'm just going to type in DeMontis Sabonis. And, like, I just want to see, like, if there's how many videos. Because when somebody is having a hot surge or somebody's doing some crazy shit, you'll just see videos. And I've only seen two. I've only seen two so far. And it's not to say that nobody's making anything about Sabonis or anything like that. But now I'm seeing three. Okay. Um, Somebody said the most disrespected NBA MVP candidate in league history. Sports sports crunch. 47,000 views in 11 days. Shout out to them. But, like, yeah, I'm not really seeing too much. And that just goes into my point of people just don't talk about DeMontis Sabonis enough. And that's a real. That's a real. He sh- probably should have had a little consideration in, in MVP voting. He will, I'm sure. Um, they are in a play-in, but he'll probably get some fifth to sixth spot consideration. But shout-out to DeMontis Sabonis, man. I just think he should get taught. It don't even have to be the MVP voting or shit like that, but um, – I guess it just comes with being a big, a big, and he's a bruiser. It's not the most sexiest game. I've always been a DeMontis Sabonis fanatic. That's just me personally. I love bigs who can pass, and I love everybody who goes against the grain. I felt like DeMontis Sabonis really made a name for himself in the league with the Pacers in a time where everybody was trying to be unicorns. Everybody was looking for a center who's going to stretch the floor and shoot threes and space it. He was like, fuck that. I'm putting my elbow into your chest. I'm moving you. I'm grabbing 20 rebounds. I'm going to pass and get six, seven assists off the elbow, handoff, screen hard, and I'm a dunk around the rim. You know what I mean? Like, and that just was phenomenal f- to me. So shout out to the minus opponents. Um, the Warriors. Warriors done won four games in a row. Four games in a row. They now have a two two game lead over the red hot Houston Rockets. Unfortunately, they had their eleven game win streak snapped against the red hot Dallas Mavericks and Luka Doncic, but. The Rockets can potentially get some get back this Thursday when they play against the Golden State Warriors. That's going to be a really, really big game. Um, the Warriors have the ball in their court. They have they have the two the two game lead. They've been playing against some easy teams and they've handled their business the, the way you should. Um, they had a really, really tough game against the Magic where Draymond Green got ejected in the first four minutes and they were still able to pull that out. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at the Warriors. And I'm looking at them to see if they're going to put the nail in the coffin this week and just end it. But if they lose to the Rockets Thursday, it's only going to make this can of warm, worms open up more. And the Rockets will have a legitimate chance to enter the play-in. Y'all know where I stand. I'm rooting for the Rockets. I'm a Rockets fan this year. I loved everything they did in the offseason from the draft to free agency to hiring Eme. I love the Rockets. We're pushing for the Rockets. Tari Eason, that's my dog. I love me some Tari Eason, even though he's hurt. So anytime, whatever team he's on, I'm going to be rooting for. I can't wait to see him back healthy. Get well, Tari Eason. Um, I just love the Rockets and what they're doing. On the court, off the court, I love the swag. I'm just a Rockets guy. They're my favorite team to watch in the Western Conference. Damn, they're my favorite team to watch in all of the NBA right now. But you know I'm still a Knicks boy at heart. Um, and just real quick, I just want to – I want to just talk about something just just 
the Wild West, right? The NBA posted this on Twitter. How wild is the West? And we're going to talk about a few things. After last night, just one game separates the top three teams in the West again. Number one seed, OKC, also clinched the playoff spot, jumps back to the top spot, which is which it last occupied on March 23rd. The Nuggets at number two, um, starting after starting the day in third. So yesterday they started the day in third. They ended now they two. The Wolves lost to the Bulls. That bumps them down to three. Conferences were first introduced in 1970-1971. Since then, the top three teams have been separated by one game or less this late in the year, just seven previous times. So how close it is at the top between the Thunder, Nuggets, and Wolves? It's only ever been that close this late in the season, seven times since 1970. So again, like I was mentioning earlier with all of the different players on all the different teams, when we talk about parity, this is it. This is it. We ain't getting, we you gotta understand, parody ain't been like this in a long time. We need to enjoy, like, I'm getting up and making this video on a Monday on April 1st. April 1st is usually a time where it'd be hard for me to squeeze out an episode on a podcast because it's like, okay, we got our top teams locked in, we got the bottom teams locked out. What do we really talk about? There's not really that many rumors, there's no drama, there's nothing important. People are probably gonna start resting. But now it's kind of the opposite. The top teams aren't locked in. The bottom teams are locked out for sure. But then you also have teams that are like, are they going to rest? Is he not going to rest? Is this team going to try to play that team? This team is only two games back. They play each other next week. It's all over the place. This dude, Jalen Brunson just had 60. Luke is going crazy. I just don't, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to take a season like this for granted because of the way the NBA is and the NBA moves so fast. Another year or so, and we could have another juggernaut of a team. And it's like, oh, shit, we know they're going to run away with the with the West. So we know they're going to run away with the East. We can pencil them in in the finals. Kind of how it was when we had the Warriors versus Cavs where year in and year out, we knew what our finals was going to be. I'm trying to take take this in as much as possible of not knowing. There's, You know, we just have this uncertainty of, like, who's going to do what, who's going to play where, who's going to make it out of what. We have our, our favorites and the teams that look the best. But everybody is kind of good right now. Um, the number four Clippers – they keep their two-game lead in the standings over the surging Mavs. The Mavs jumped to five. Um, after sitting in eighth on March 16th, the Mavericks win over the Rockets, tied them with the Pelicans at 45-29, and 29, with Dallas taking the tiebreaker to move into the fifth seed. The number seven Kings, Sacramento, moves into a tie with Phoenix, but owns the tiebreaker. The Kings sit two behind the Pelicans in six. Everything is close right now, y'all. Everything is close. The number nine Lakers. The Lakers stand one and a half games behind the Kings and Suns after LeBron's spectacular 40-point performance against the Brooklyn Nets. Nine three-point shots. King James, I think, is shooting better from three this season than Steph Curry. I saw that, and they were like, no no April Fools. This is a real stat. He's shooting 41% from three. Steph is like at 40.5, 40.6% from three. Just kind of crazy. Warriors create space in the 10th. Not only did the Rockets win streak in at 11 games, but Houston's loss and Golden State's win gave the Warriors a two-game lead for the 10th seed. Sunday marked the first time that the Rockets lost ground to the Warriors on a day Houston played since March 6th. They had cut five and a half games away from Golden State's lead in that time. That is crazy. And then last but not least, the Dubs and Rockets meet on Thursday giving Golden State a chance to add another game or Houston to make another jump. So, again, what I said before I read off that, another way um, for the Houston Rockets to, to gain ground or for the Warriors to kind of continue to separate. The league is on fire. The MVP race is outstanding. Um, the All-NBA is going to be nice. We're going to have so much going on, even with the, the college basketball. We got guys playing out, out, out of their minds. Donovan Klingon, I, I, I just – I don't even know where to project him now the way he's played in the tournament. People are texting me about Zach Eady. Where is he going to go? Um, Stefan Castle plays for UConn. He's a projected lottery pick. It's just it's just a lot going on right now. It's a lot going on. So um, I, I'm I'm obsessed. I'm obsessive right now about the basketball world. Um, the transfer portal and NCAA basketball is going off. Uh, I just I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, anyway. The last portion of the episode, the meat and potatoes, the five scariest teams heading into the playoffs. So when I think about scary teams, it's not necessarily what you've done this year. Um, it's not what you 
for the full. It's not. It's not. Let me not say it's not what you've done for the year. It is what you've done for the year, but it's more so how you project for playoff basketball. The regular season in the NBA is a lot different than the playoffs. Um, teams tidy it up on offense. You try to slow down those possessions, take care of the basketball. The tempos drop. The pace drop. Um, defenses get a little bit more grittier. The the whistle with the refs are a little different. And then you get the best version of the best players. The top of the top is always going to show. The cream of the crop comes out in the playoffs. And because of that, I put together my five teams that I just really wouldn't want to see. Based off how they project to look in the playoffs, roster structure, different statistical standpoints as a team, individual guys that you just worry about. Um, and based off seeding, it also makes them a little dangerous. The team I have at number five is the Los Angeles Lakers, right? Um, a team that last year was a tough matchup for teams. And uh, they end up going on a playoff run where they eventually met the eventual champions, which were the Nuggets who swept them. But even then, they pushed them in every game and really made them work for it. So right now, the Los Angeles Lakers have the 16th best offense in the NBA. They have the 14th best defense, and they have the fourth fastest pace. Their third and field goal percentage, making nearly 50% of their shots as an overall team, which I think is magnificent, and it shows, again, the efficiency and how dangerous they can be. Their third and free throw attempts. Something that I know a lot of people around the league are going to talk about a lot of fans. The Lakers get those calls. But here's the other funny part about this. They're third in free throw attempts, and their opponents are second and last. So they get to the free throw line the third most, and they send their opponents to the free throw line the second least. So when people talk about the whistle in L.A., it is funny. It is funny that they get fouled a bunch, and then they also don't foul a bunch. I'm not trying to speculate. I don't want to throw nothing on the Laker fans because I know how crazy they get. It's just a funny stat to look at. You get to the free throw line a bunch, but you barely foul with that aggressive ass defense that they play. They got a lot of hacks out there. They got a lot. The Lakers have a lot of hacks. They have a lot of hacks. If I'm just being uh, completely honest, they're seven to three point percentage, which I love for them at 38 percent. Whenever you have LeBron James constructed teams, it's so important for, for them to be able to hit outside shots. LeBron is going to drive. LeBron is going to command defenses to collapse. And because of that, when he's making that extra pass, because he's a willing passer, we've seen that. Even when the game is on the line, LeBron is going to try to make the right play. And it's very important and it's very crucial for his teammates to be able to make shots. Sometimes LeBron has been on teams with guys who are known three-point shooters. And for whatever reason, it just feels like they don't make shots. I remember when Kyle Korver went to the Cavs and I was like, oh, shit. How could y'all ever let Kyle Korver get to the Cavs next to LeBron James? All of the three-point shots LeBron is going to generate for Kyle Korver, it's going to be ugly. And I remember Kyle Korver missing some shots and missing a lot of big threes in that in that finals with the Cavs. He was like, damn, like Kyle Korver missing those? You, don't, you feel like these are the shots that he would just love to be able to just catch and shoot and make? And I, I've always never understood the way that that works. Is it like, is LeBron... Are, are his teammates not getting enough rhythm? Is the stage too big? Is it th him? Is it them? I've never been able to really put my finger on that just because, like, I understand it from a rocket standpoint with James Harden. It's a lot of standing. It's a lot of tween, 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 pick and roll. If at the last resort Harden has to pass it to us, he will. But he's going to look to score. LeBron is more or less – kind of the opposite i think lebron is looking to pass first out of the pick and roll and, and driving and, and generating shots and i think he's looking to score second but his teammates in the playoffs even in a clutch when you look at the lakers um clutch three-point shooting it drops a lot it really does it drop it, it, it drops a whole lot which we'll get to at some point um just to continue going, they're, they're very solid in the half-court offense, which I think is a big proponent in being a really good playoff team. They're 14th in points per possession um, in the half-court offense. One thing that I don't like about the half-court offense is that the offensive rebounding sucks. They have nobody. They, like it, It's it's bad. And I just think that when you have as much size as they have with LeBron, with AD, with Rui, Jerry Vanderbilt when he's healthy, um, even the minutes that you get from Jackson Hayes, Christian Wood potentially like for them to be as bad as they are. I'm just not a, I'm, I just don't like it. 
They need second chance points and second chance opportunities um, in the half court offense. You need it. You're going to need it in the playoffs. And when you play against a team like potentially the Thunder, they could get matched up against the Thunder in the first round. I think the Thunder can at times be vulnerable on the glass. And your advantage, they're, the, the, don't get me wrong, the Lakers are a really good defensive rebounding team. They close out possessions. They clash the glass. They are phenomenal there. But on the offensive side of it, you need to be able to send guys to that glass if you're going to play a vulnerable OKC in the first round. You need to be able to have guys to take advantage of that. If you're leaving points on the board off of second-chance opportunities, you're probably not going to get that far, especially with a, with a, a half-court offense that's essentially average. Essentially, it's just average. What I do like about the Lakers, though, is they have LeBron James, <laughs> like one of the best weapons you can have when it comes to playoffs. And LeBron James right now is the league leader in scoring in the fourth quarter. Scoring eight points per game in the fourth. Um, and that is probably why the Lakers are second in scoring in a clutch. And in a clutch time, the Lakers are averaging 11 two points. A second. They getting the job done in the clutch. So when the game slows down, when the game is close in the playoffs or in the play-in, I got faith in the Lakers to pull through. Because as a team, they're clutch, and they have the highest fourth-quarter score in LeBron James, who's also going to do his shit in the clutch. And then they also score in transition. They, they're fifth in transition scoring. They're, fo- they're fourth in post scoring, which, you know, Anthony Davis, LeBron being able to get touches there. They're eighth in scoring off cuts, which means they have some movement. And then again, they're 38% from three on catch and shoot threes. So when you think about the drives that they're going to have from LeBron, you think about um, the, the post-up scoring, which is, like I said, fourth in the NBA, which could command double teams. When you're kicking it out, when you have movement from cuts, and, and you have LeBron getting, getting to the cup off drives, it's going to open up a lot of three-point opportunities. And I just love that the Lakers are making those shots. Now, what I did say a few minutes ago, that three-point shooting drops to 29% in the clutch. 29%. That's almost a 10% drop-off from their regular standing, from their regular uh, standard shooting off catch and shoot opportunities. That concerns me a lot because, again, LeBron is a make-the-right-play type of player. So when a clutch, you're playing in a play-in against right now, it says the Warriors, you're playing in the play-in, and if you win that, you have to play another game. So the, the, the Lakers would have to win two games to make it to the playoffs. They'll play the loser of the Kings' Suns. It's two games where you're probably going to have some clutch. It's going to be some clutch time on both of those games, probably. And LeBron is going to have the basketball because he's their top fourth, fourth quarter scorer in the NBA. Teams are going to be aware of these numbers, just, just like I have access. They have access as well. They're going to game plan around it, and the game plan is going to be to stop LeBron and make somebody else beat us, and the shots LeBron is going to generate are going to be catch-and-shoot three-point looks, and it's going to be up to Austin Reeves to knock him down. D'Angelo Russell is going to have to knock him down. Rui Hachimura might have to knock some down. Cam Reddish is going to have to knock some down, especially guys like Cam Reddish and Torian Prince because those are the guys that defense is like – uh, Golden State are going to say, hey, D'Angelo Russell, he, we, we've seen him make big threes. He did it against us. We've seen Reeves make big shots. Let's make Cam Reddish make some shots. That's probably going to be the game plan. Let's make Torian Prince make some shots. If Jared Vanderbilt is going to be healthy and playing then, he needs to make some shots. If Gabe Vincent is going to play minutes, he's going to have to make some shots. So that's my big thing that I'm watching out for for the Lakers. But other than that, I just love the way that they shape up. The, the fact that they can go out and get stops because defensively they got a lot of size there. Um, they obviously don't have that necessarily great point of attack defender, especially not having Jared Vanderbilt. Hopefully he'll be healthy and ready for that. I think he he is projected to, to, to be ready at 100% then. You'll have that option there. Obviously we know what Anthony Davis does as the back line defender. Um, and as a team, they defend really well, which allows them to get out and transition and get easy buckets. Um, because they are so limited with like isolation guys and um, ball handler guys and different things like that, it's going to run through Braun and D'Lo. I like being able to get out and get easy buckets. That's one of my favorite components for really good teams, being able to score in transition, being able to get it in half court, being able to control the glass, um, being able to limit limit three-point shots, being able to make three-point shots. These are all a recipe of things that the Lakers have to their advantage while also having LeBron James, who coincidentally is the fourth quarter league leading score right now and they're just 
phenomenal in a clutch. Phenomenal. And when you're going to have to go through two games to get into the playoffs, you're going to need some some clutch genes. Um, and for them to have that fourth pace, I do want to see them slow it down a little bit because I know the Lakers can be a little itsy with the ball and they can turn that ball over a lot. And some of that may have to do with the pace. But other than that, I mean, I'm, I'm really liking what I'm getting from them. Um, the ISO scoring is 13th in the NBA, by the way. They're getting uh, 6.8 points per game in isolation scoring, which actually isn't as bad. You know what I mean? Like, that's really good for a Lakers team when, when you think about it. 13th in isolation. I'll take that from uh, from this from this Lakers team. So, shout out to the Lakers. They're my number 14. I look at their route. Um, I, I I feel like they can they can win against the Warriors. That opening play, play-in game, I would probably put my money on the Lakers. After the All-Star break, I thought by far it would be the Warriors. I thought it would be the Warriors, hands down. I thought they would probably be one of the best – hottest second half teams of the league uh, in, in the entire league and I thought that they would probably even make a push to not be in the 10th seed but I was wrong Draymond continues to have these ejections and technical fouls and he's getting into shit with people he got into the little skirmish with Grant Williams and I understand you got to stand up for yourself you can't let people do whatever and just not be yourself Draymond has to be Draymond but I think Draymond also has to be just a little bit more just a little bit more aware of everything that's at stake and everything that's on the line. Y'all have a chance to potentially miss the playoffs. And the Warriors, especially this year, have been a lot better with you on the floor, my guy. Which is why you see the frustration with Steve Kerr. Which is why you see this frustration with Steph Curry when you're constantly getting yourself into shit because they are aware of how important you are for them to make this playoff push. And again, y'all are just trying to get this chance. The Rockets are on y'all heels to take away the chance. Even if y'all continue to have this lead over the Rockets, it don't, it's only for the 10th seed, and you still have the play-in, where even if you beat the Lakers, you're going to have to play another game. You have to win two games just to get into the playoffs. So Draymond has to understand that and the magnitude that's coming with it. But as of right now, because of that, and because there's not really that much trustworthy people on that roster outside of Steph, that I feel com- confident in, Steph and Kaminga. And I mean, I guess because it's going to be the playoffs and a play in, you have to believe in Clay. He just knows how to get it together. But Andrew Wiggins, I'm not really afraid of. Um, Draymond Green, I mean, I, he, he he makes them better. But if I'm the Lakers, am I really worried about Trace Jackson Davis? He's a really good player, but I got Anthony Davis. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's I, I, I don't know. The, the Warriors just don't have enough right now, and they really have to rely on Steph Curry and his magical um, games. And again, if you're the Warriors, the one thing you have on your side is that Steph Curry is always, always up for a magical game. But if I'm the Lakers, I like my chances against the Warriors um, in a play in game. So um, shout out to the Lakers. I'm, I'm, I'm having them as one of my top five scariest teams. And if the Lakers are able to handle their business. If the Lakers are able to take care of Steph Curry and the Warriors, then take care of the loser of the Suns or Kings, which either or is going to be a tough matchup. And then they go in to play the Thunder. Hey, man. I'm I'm, I'm worried. Look at what LeBron just did against Brooklyn. 40 points, nine threes. Thunder. I I love y'all. I like y'all team. When LeBron is on that mission and he smells blood in the water and he's going to smell the inexperience with y'all and he's going to smell the inexperience with y'all coaching staff. Hey. Hey. I, 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 would, I, would, I would straighten up my posture a little bit. Y'all been having a phenomenal season, but this is the type of shit that LeBron is searching for. He want, He wants that inexperience. He wants to be able to manipulate the whistle. He wants to be able to shake y'all with the L.A. Staples Center crowd. You know what I'm saying? Like, come out, play mind games. He's going to be out there calling y'all plays, saying it loud. Oh, yeah, this the elbow four. Watch Shay. Watch Shay. Shay going to go to his right. That's going to, you know, for an inexperienced team, that's going to fuck you up a little bit. That's going to fuck you up a little bit. I know he does it in a regular season, too, but in the playoffs, Y'all thought y'all threw in a new fold into a new play, and LeBron is calling it out. Lebr- AD, you going to go there. J-Dub going to go around his right to the left. Yeah. Yeah, huh? And then check on. Pro- when he's out there doing that shit, I know that shit be fucking up young teams. I know it does because it would fuck me up. It's like, damn, we just added that yesterday. How he know that? 
and you hear all these stories about I'm just saying, you know what I mean? I, it's not it's not anything to take away from the Thunder. I still respect you. I still love the team. But I, me personally, if I was a Thunder fan, I would be like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Here come, here come this motherfucker. Here come the all-time leading score. <laughs> um, my number four scariest team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I'm, I'm sorry for my visual people watching on YouTube. I am looking down because I am a note taker. I'm showing y'all right now. I'm a note taker. I got papers on papers on papers with notes and different things because in in this in this uh, industry in this genre of this of what I do, you have to make sure everything you're saying is factual. And when I try not to write it down and memorize it, I'll mess up a stat, and then people will be like, "Man, you lied. You don't watch basketball. Look, you said this and that. You have to be so straight lined." So I, I'm getting back to my note writing because I I do have a lot of shit on my mind, and it makes me forget certain things. So. Excuse me if I'm not looking directly in the camera for some of this. But the Cavaliers, my number four team, uh, 18th offensively, and they're fifth defensively. Um, one thing that I, I noted that I had to take a look at was they're 19 and 20 in the clutch. They're a below 500 team in the clutch, which is concerning a little bit. Um, Donovan Mitchell is the 17th fourth quarter score, averaging 16, I mean, averaging 6.8 points per game in the clutch. So you do have that. Um, the half-court offense, a little disappointing. It's 18th, 18th in half-court offense. But the one thing that I will say with a lot of these stats and a lot of these things that I have in front of me is the Cavaliers have had a tough season on the injury part. And that's why I really am happy with the way that the season has turned out for them, the fact that they are comfortably right now in that top four, three, five, you know what I mean? Like three to five, they're, they're going to avoid the plan. Normally teams who have had these, this much injury history throughout the season is probably straddling the play in to six seed. They're comfortably going to be three, four, five. That's just going to be the way it shapes up them. The Knicks and the magic are all fighting for that spot. And if you get hot to close out the year, who knows what number two will look like, but I'm just going to keep it three, four, five. Um, even this, this past month specifically, Donovan Mitchell has played four games in March. He's averaging 13 points on 29% shooting, 33% from the three. He's made every free throw. Obviously, he's still being bothered by that jawline fracture, what jawbone, whatever that whole jaw thing was. It's bothering him. He missed majority of March, played only four games, and the four games he did play, including the last two that he played, just weren't good. So they need him to really get fully healthy, really get fully comfortable and get back going because he's the engine to what they do. And he's the one that gives them that, that big chance of being able to compete out East, especially if you fall, find yourself in a four or five matchup like last year, um, or even a three, six, where in a three, six matchup right now, they would be playing against the Indiana Pacers and Indiana isn't as good as them, but Indiana is a team you want to be wide awake for. Cause if not, you'll have your ass packing your bags home, talking about the lights are too bright again. Um, 19th in transition scoring, slower pace team, 25th pace, 25th in pace, uh, 21 points per game in transition. They're 24th in ISO scoring, which I think is a is a surprising when you have Darius Garland and and and, and Donovan Mitchell. But they also have two bigs that they can rely on to, in pick and roll to do a lot of roll scoring. So um, that's the next thing. They're sixth in roll man scoring. You know, Jared Allen said no screens and diving to the basket has been really lucrative for them. And I think that that's something they should continue to tap into. I love them when they're in a pick and roll bag, having Jared Allen be a diver, having the shooting that they uh, acquired over the offseason, whether it's Max Struess, whether it's George Niang, whether it's Sam Arrell, um, whether it's Donovan Mitchell or Darius Garland. Both of those guys can spray and shoot the ball. We saw Evan Mobley hit a big three last week. Like, I love their pick and roll play. And um, it's no surprise to see them sixth in roll man scoring, um, 30th in, in post score. I think that's I think that's nice. For them. I don't want to see them scoring in the post, um, but it will be something that you have to look at, look at when it comes to half court scoring for the playoffs. Um, third in handoff scoring, second in cut scoring and the third and um, putback scoring. So they're attacking that out. They're, they're third in points per possession and putback scoring. Jared Allen, Evan Mobley guys attacking that offensive glass and getting those putbacks. Is, is going to be key for them in the playoffs as well. But again, Evan Mobley as well as Donovan Mitchell missed majority of March. He missed the beginning of it, but his last five games, 17, 6, and 4, as he starts to get his mojo back going after being out for a while, um, I think they're going to be a really tough team to match up with out east. You know what I mean? I think that they could beat the Pacers in five games. Like, seriously. I think they can win that in five. This team is loaded. The whole thing is health. 
They missed Darius Garland for a portion. They missed Donovan for March. They missed uh, Mobley for a portion. They missed him in March. Um, they have to be healthy. They have to be healthy, and they have to be able to f- figure out how to generate uh, a potent offense in a half-court set through the pick-and-roll because they're not going to abandon the pick-and-roll. But you do have two kind of bigs. Evan Mobley can step out and make it three, but it's still not a big part of his game. That kind of keeps everything tight. If you have him in the corner and you're doing a pick and roll, the defense has some space to gap where they're not going to really be threatened by that. But then again, you have the additions that you made with uh, George Niang, Max Struess, Sam Arell, all of that shooting. Isaac Okoro shooting a three ball really well too. So um, I like that. And defensively, they're going to be tough to score on. With those same two dudes that I just mentioned on the offensive end, they're going to clog up that paint. They're always going to have help there. Karis LeVert has been phenomenal for them defensively. Isaac Okoro is obviously a dog defensively. Like, I am so blown away by the Cleveland Cavaliers on the defensive side of the basketball that it's kind of it's kind of crazy. I'm removing, removing recent performances without some of the guys. But overall, the Cleveland Cavaliers, I think, have enough because on the defensive end, that's where they're going to lay their hat at. And you're hoping Donovan Mitchell for the playoffs is at full strength and is ready to go. And I think him, Garland, the pick and roll play surrounded by the shooters, they will have enough offense to maintain themselves in a series against the Pacers, against the Orlando, even against my Knicks. I think the defense is where they lay their hat at and they can get by on offense. And Donovan Mitchell is known as a playoff riser. So as long as he's healthy, you can count on him playing irregular at a high level, and that should be enough to propel you for a playoff run. If everything ties in, everything ties right, I'm looking at the Cavaliers as one of the most dangerous teams that you could face in the Eastern Conference. Um, switching gears a little bit, going over to the Western Conference side of the things, I got the Pelicans as my number three scariest teams heading into the playoffs. The New Orleans Pelicans are just one of the most well-rounded teams in the entire NBA, and that scares me for anybody that, that they're going to have to face. Right now, it's projected that they would face that they would face the Minnesota Timberwolves. And as much as I like the Timberwolves and I love the Timberwolves defense, this is probably not the matchup that you want. Just being honest, this is probably not the matchup that you want. If you are Minnesota, you are trying your hardest to go get that one or two seed. You do not want to face the Pelicans. And I know it's tough because if you get number one, then you're probably facing the Lakers, who are my number five scariest team. But the Pelicans, fourth defensively, 12th offensively, and they have a 17th pace. They're third in steals, averaging eight steals per game. They're seventh in rebounding. They close out possessions. Um, They're 23rd in free throw attempts a game, which is eighth. They get to that line, and then they shoot 38% from three, which is sixth in all of the NBA. And those numbers are important because of Zion Williamson. So you're trying to figure out ways to stop and limit Zion Williamson. He's just going to continue to attack, 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 attack. And his attacking is allowing him to get to the free throw line, which is allowing teams to get in foul trouble. It's allowing the Pelicans to get in the bonus early. And then that allows everybody else to kind of follow suit and then get to the free throw line. And that's how they're constantly getting to that that line. They're closing out possessions, which I think is really, really big for good defensive teams. You don't want to allow your opponents to get second chance points, third chance points, fourth chance points. When you play a good 24 seconds of defense, you want to close out that possession and go down the other way. The worst thing in sports or in basketball is to lock up for 20 plus seconds and then give the team the ball back and give them another chance to score. And now that good possession of defense that you just had kind of goes out of the window that could be a really big deflating thing throughout the course of a game especially in the fourth quarter during crunch time um they're 12th in points possession points per possession in the half court which means their half court offense will translate well in the play in the playoffs so when you face against the minnesota timberwolves team and they got you in a half court slowing the game up a little bit and they're really trying to lock in the pelicans are saying they they have an answer for that um they're 20th in transition I wish they had a little bit higher than that with some of the athletes that they have and some of the st- because they are one of the league leaders in steals per game. You would think that that would just cause them generating transition looks easily because they close out possessions and are one of the best rebounding team. Again, you would think that that allowed them to just get right into transition buckets. But I would prefer the Pelicans 
to have more of a half court offense that's effective than relying heavily on a transition because though they do have some athletes like Trey Murphy the third, Zion Williamson that can get out, even Herb Jones I think is a transition athlete. You want to be able to have your half court threats largely having a rhythm. You want CJ to find a way to be effective. Brandon Ingram is more of a half court offensive guy. And Zion being effective in a half court play is such an important part in all of their offensive scheme because, like I mentioned, him driving is going to make defenses collapse and it's going to allow those three point looks and you're making 38 percent of them to open up. And it's going to allow you to put teams in foul trouble and allow you to get to the free throw line. You want to be able to have those key components. They cross out the boxes. They can control the glass with their rebounder. They can get steals and get out into transition for easy looks. They get to the free throw line. They generate good three-point shots and are able to knock down the three-point shots. And then they have guys who can score the basketball all over the place. CJ can go off and get hot and win you a game. Brandon Eagle can get hot and win you a game. And we know what Zion can do. They're seventh in isolation scoring. Seventh. They shoot 49% from the field in isolation. That's number one in the entire NBA. Their foul frequency, how frequently they get fouled during isolation, is at a 16%. That's second in the entire NBA. A lot of these signs are pointing back to Zion. You figure Zion is getting isolation at the elbow, he's attacking, and he's getting fouled. You picture Zion is attacking from the elbow in isolation, and he's getting a layup. So that makes them a super efficient isolation team. And then Brandon Ingram is a, is a mid-range killer in isolation. And then you got CJ McCollum, who's a three-level scorer, and he can get his in a, in a bevy of ways in isolation as well. But for them to be as efficient as they are and to generate those type of free-throw looks and foul frequency, you know, the free-throw rate, phenomenal. And then they're across the board. They're top 10 in putback scoring. They're top 10 in post-up scoring. They're top 10 in spot-up scoring. They're top 10 in handoff scoring. They're 11th in, in scoring off of screens. Like, they are legitimately a well-rounded machine. They're top 10 in all of those different um, scoring play types. And that's just the 12th offense. And then and as a 12th ranked offense, they're top 10 in all of that. And then we also just went into the isolation with some of the threats that they have. You know what I mean? And then defensively, they have a lot of defensive weapons. You got Herb. Dyson Daniels is now returned. And he'll he'll start to re revamp so he can get ready for the playoffs. Jose Alvarado on what he does. Valanchunas isn't no defensive anchor or rim protector, but his rebounding does well to close out possessions. Trey Murphy is a long, versatile defensive option to have out there as well. So I really like what they have. And then you have the rotation. They have depth. They have uh, CJ, Herb, B.I., Zion, and Val as the five. Then off the bench, you got Murphy, Alvarado, Najee Marshall. You got Larry Nance. Uh, you got Jordan Hawkins. Like I said, Dyson Daniels is back. Um you, you, you got my guy, uh, Matt Ryan, who can come out and, and just shoot some threes. The only concerning thing I have to say about the Pelicans as them being my third scariest team heading into the playoffs is the clutch numbers. They're 12 and 14th in, clutch, in the clutch. They're 27th in scoring at 6.9 points per clutch per game in the clutch. They're 30th in games played in the clutch, which it's a pro and a con. That means they handle any business, but that also means that to times that they do play in a clutch, it hasn't been that pretty. And then that three point percentage, that's six in the NBA at 38%. It drops to 24% from three in a clutch. That's tough. That's t those are tough numbers to have in, in, in the clutch time because you have some, some viable options. You know what I mean? I'm just thinking like, why we just get Zion that ball at the elbow and we, we, we get to it. We get to it. Um, the one thing I will say about some of the clutch numbers, they are eighth in opponent clutch scoring at 7.7, .7, which is good defensively. But even at even at that defensive level in a clutch, that still outscores them. 7.7 .7 is good, but it outscores their 6.9. So they're still getting outplayed in the clutch time, which is why they're two games below 500 when, it's, when we come to the clutch. But again, they are a team that, I would be afraid to match up with because of what they can do defensively, because of all the versatility that they have, 
um, with Brandon Ingram and and, and, and and Trey Murphy and Herb Jones. Herb Jones is a point of attack defender. They can close out possessions. They can get out and transition. They're going to generate steals with Alvarado and Herb Jones. Trey Murphy can get out and dunk. He can knock down threes. Jordan Hawkins can hit threes. Matt Ryan hit threes. CJ McCollum, isolation, Brandon. E. Like they have so many different ways to beat you and to control the game. And if I am the Timberwolves, that scares me a little bit. That scares me. Or if I'm the, the Clippers, who they've thrown, they've gave the Clippers fits all season long. And it's going to be tough. I'm interested to see the matchup against the Minnesota Timberwolves because how is the Rudy versus Zion matchup going to look? And I'm not even saying that they're going to be matched up together, but like how is Rudy's shot blocking going to impact Zion, especially when they have Valanciunas there who's also going to be around the paint and can clog it up. We know Valanciunas can step out and hit a shot, but for the most part, Rudy being matched up on him is going to allow him to be there for those those drives that that Zion has, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to that matchup if it can happen. Down to the last two scariest teams going into the playoffs. We we are hour and five minutes in. The New York Knicks are my number two team. Um, we're tenth offensively right now. Uh, we're ninth defensively, and we have had the second best defense in all of March. We were phenomenal in March. We were shutting teams down, and we also played with the thirtieth pace. I love that for us because we grinded so much and on a defensive end that we have to play at our own place on, on, on offense. And it, it's a way that allows us to not allow Jalen Brunson to get ran down during the course of games. Just play at a slow pace, bring it up slowly. Because we work so hard on defense, it allows everybody to kind of catch their breath and get gathered and settled in. And I don't like when teams try to speed you up. When you play it fast, it leads to so many different turnovers and so many different miscues and different things like that. So I appreciate us playing at a slower pace. Um, my best, my favorite, and I think the best trait we have, especially for the playoffs, we're number one in offensive rebounding. That is so pivotal and so key in these series when you're playing against really good teams who are going to be really good defensively. And like my boy D. Mill says, they're going to muck up these games. And for us to be able to get second, third, fourth, fifth, second chance opportunities and getting ourselves the extra 13 possessions per game from crashing offensive rebounds. I love it. I love it. It's deflating for other teams. It gives us other chances and it just allows us to really take teams out. When you have a six point lead and you miss a shot and you get the offensive rebound, and you get to hold it for the last possession of the second half and you end with a bang and the crowd going crazy. Like these are all things that are just adding up to playoff moments. You know what I mean? Even last night, we had a couple of chances at a at a at a game winning shot or to win the game and to take it home because of the offensive rebounds. We miss a shot, you call a timeout, drop another play, do this, drop another. Like it, it was incredible. So I think in the playoffs, that's gonna be big for us. Another thing is that we're 15 and 4 in the clutch. You know, ain't the greatest record, but it is above 500. But like a lot of other teams, that three point percentage for us drops. We're shooting 26% from three in the clutch. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, we're 16th in points in a clutch at uh, 8.3. And then Brunson is 19th in fourth quarter scoring at 6.4. I don't know if that's because he's getting worn down. I don't know if that's because things are getting predictable. Um, I am a fan of the current version of this team because I do think it makes Jalen Brunson that guy. But hopefully we will be able to have Julius Randle at full health come playoff time. That's why also the number two for my, my scariest team is because we, we're we missing, theoretically, two big-time starters. We're missing an all-NBA caliber starter and an all-defensive player starter who we've seen with OG on the floor. We're damn near unbeatable. There's nobody that can really fuck with us when we have OG on and on the floor just because of what he does defensively and how he meshes on offense with our other go-to guys. We're 15th in ISO scoring at 6.6 .6 points per game. We're 10th in points per possession in half-court offense at 118.5, 118 points per five per possession, which is brilliant, I think, for a half-court offense like the Knicks, where a lot of it is just being generated by Jalen Brunson. Um, we're 15th to transition. Obviously, like I said, we play a little bit of a slower pace, but it's still nice to be able to have that balance and get out in the transition when we do have good uh, defensive possessions. We're fourth in spot-up scoring. Again, Jalen Brunson being able to operate drive the basketball, get two feet in the paint, collapse the defense, and being able to kick out to the Dante DiVincenzos, the Miles McBrides, the Bojan Bogdanovic, the Alec Burks, and all, those, and all of those different type of things. 
really, 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 really brilliant for us in that standpoint. Um, fit the hand handoff scoring. Jalen Brunson coming off, being able to get the handoffs and get into work, diving into the paint, getting into that mid-range pull-up and a pull-up shooting. Brilliant for us there. And then we're eighth in drives. Jalen Brunson is going to drive the basketball. When Julius Randle is healthy, he's going to drive the basketball. Josh Hart is going to drive the basketball. And again, because we shoot the ball so, so well on catch and shoot, 38% from three on catch and shoot um, opportunities, driving the basketball is just opening up all of that for us. So we are... Uh, we have a we have a scheme where we can really make the game gritty from a defensive standpoint. Really control the glass on both sides. We're really good defensive. Uh, we're really good rebounding team overall, and we're the best at offensive rebounding. And I think being able to have a guy like Jalen Brunson control the game from an offensive standpoint, not being able to be sped up, and then having as much depth as we have, and then that depth coming with shooting. I think we we are probably one of the most feared teams out east to match up with in the series. If if the, no matter who you are, and then you add in the fact that OG Ananobi, our, our one of the best perimeter defenders you can have in the league, would be on our team, and then you add in another offensive force in Julius Randle, dog, full health Knicks you do not want to see. We 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 get gritty, we get dirty, we get feisty. Without without two starters, we had the second best defense in the NBA. We were we was out there holding teams to below, but below eighty points. One of the games we lost. One of the games we lost. We ain't scored over seventy either, so over eighty either. But damn, we did that twice. By the way, we lock teams up. That's what we do. And because of the offensive firepower we have from Jalen Brunson, I got faith in us to be able to uh, to to close it out again. I'm I, the clutch numbers. They aren't, they aren't the worst, but they aren't the greatest either. And I think we're going to need a little bit more variety of, of, of looks and plays. Even against OKC, it was nice that Jalen Brunson was able to make plays and different things like that. But you could see in that game and in the Spurs game where he had the 60, it's, it's tiring. It's tiring and it's predictable. So defenses are kind of just ready to throw everything at him. And uh, it, it's kind of it's kind of too much to put on one guy. Um, down the stretch of games like that when he's already led us through the the entire way. Somebody got to be able to step up and make shots, especially off that bench. I want to see some I want to see some games from Alec Burks where he's able to alleviate that. I think Miles McBride has done a good job of that in, in, in March uh, where he was just stepping up and having big performances. Dante DiVincenzo with his three-point shooting. More guys being able to take some of that lead, that, that pressure off of Brunson will really help us in the long run come playoff time. Um, And last but not least, before we wrap up and get up out of here, my last and final most scariest team heading into the playoffs, the Dallas Mavericks. Sixth in offense, 20th in defense. They're 17th defensively since the All-Star break, and they were 10th defensively in all of March. They play with at the seventh uh, fastest pace. They're six in points per possession in half-court offense, which is absolutely brilliant. That's that's the greatest news you want to hear heading into the playoffs. They are also 21-8 in the clutch. They have the highest win percentage in clutch time uh, games. They're 11th in points in, in clutch time scoring. They're second in three-point shooting in the clutch. They're second in opponent scoring um, in the clutch at 6.4. Like, clutch time, they are absolutely phenomenal. They want they want to be in clutch time. Like, their numbers are so brilliant that they're looking to make, to make the game a clutch time situation because – Defensively, they're there. Offensively, defenses have no answers for what they do with Kyrie and Luka Doncic. And and going on top of that with the clutch time scoring, they have two top 10 fourth quarter scoring leaders. Luka is the fifth leading scorer in the fourth quarter at 7.5 points per game. And Kyrie is 10th at 7.1 points per game in, in the fourth quarter. So just off two of your guys that you have, you're averaging 14 and a half points in a fourth quarter just from two guys. They're the only team with two top ten guys in fourth quarter scoring. There's no other team that has a, has a top two scores um, in the fourth quarter in, in the top 15. You have to get to the top 20, and you got Embiid and Tyrese Maxey, and that could be a little scary because, obviously, Joel Embiid has missed a lot of time. So Kyrie and Luka Doncic, with the overall performance of the team and the clutch, I mean – this team is for not this this team is as good as it can get. Um 
They're also a second in isolation scoring. They give you 12 and a half points per game in isolation. Um, they're second in total isolate, isolation or isolation frequency. Again, Luka and Kyrie. They're ninth in transition scoring. So as good as their offense is in the half court, they can also get out and run with you. They're eighth in pick and roll scoring, which is no surprise there. They're shooting 47% from the field in pick and rolls. Um, they're number one in loose ball recovery. They're fourth in screen assists. This team right now, they don't really lack much. And because of the moves that they made um, during the deadline, they have depth. I saw a game where Exum against the Rockets, Exum hit some threes. He's had some performances. He don't shoot too many, but when he does, he's shooting better than 50% from three. Kyrie Irving can take over a game. We saw the game when the shot he had against Denver. Luka just took over the game last night against Houston. That's no surprise. He's been doing that all season. You got Lively and Gafford, front court depth, who both play well with Luka, but the pick and roll and the dive and scoring and the lobs uh, and even getting second chance points. You got P.J. Washington and Maxi Kleber, who on any, any given night can make two to three threes out of, out of pick and pop or catch and shoot. Tim Hardaway Jr. is phenomenal on catch and shoot threes, and he can he can turn a series around with his three-point shooting if he get out at the right time. Um, they're getting Jaden I, I, Jaden Hardy a little bit more comfortable coming off the bench. Josh Green should be returning soon. Like The Dallas Mavericks have a lot going on, and they have a lot to throw at you. Um, and like I said, defensively, they keep climbing and climbing and climbing at the right time and starting to click on that end. They they guarded Houston so, so well with knowing how Jalen Green has been performing, that the defense they gave him was super respectable. Um, but also, it limited him and it stopped him. And it allowed them to snap a red-hot Houston Rockets. They really dominated that whole game through. And the Rockets had no answer for Luka. And there is no team that's going to have an answer for Luka. And based off everything that's in front of me, not only is it just Luca, it's the full team. You know what I mean? Like Luca is a big, 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 big part of this for sure. Not arguing that at all. But when you have two top 10 fourth quarter scores on your team that can combine and give you 15 points a night in the fourth quarter between just them two. How do you stop that? How do you stop? No wonder they're the, they're, they're the, the number one team in a clutch. No wonder. You got a team that can score in transition, team that can score in offense, team that can score in pick and roll, team that can score in isolation, team that can score in catch and shoot threes, team that can score at the uh, front of the elbow, team that can score. Uh, I don't know. This team can score everywhere, man. I, I, I like. And then they do the little shit. Number one, and loose balls recovered. I just did not expect the Mavericks to be in there, but maybe that's because I'm not a Mavericks fan watching every single game that they play. And then fourth and screen assists. You know, they're like they're just a very well-rounded, dangerous team. They won seven straight. They're matched up to play against the Clippers. We know how Luka loves the matchup against the Clippers. For whatever reason, he is looking at the Clippers as food. That's a matchup that I'm scared of if I'm if I'm L.A. I'm scared of. We're treading in the wrong direction. We're giving up around 40-plus percent from three on any given night right now for the Clippers. They just have abandoned the three-point line. They can't guard that at all. And you're playing it. You're, you're potentially going to match up with a team that's red hot, and they're going to generate all of these three-point looks with Luka. You're going to have to send help at him. And all of the three, he can make the right pass. I, yo, if you got to face a, if you got to face the Dallas Mavericks, you are your favorite team. Good luck to you. But they are my number one most dangerous team. And Luka Doncic may be on his way to winning his first MVP. Long awaited. I've been picking him as my MVP favorite the last two or three years. Maybe this is finally the year. I don't know. Um, but I appreciate everybody that, t- that stayed. We have a full one hour and 18 minute podcast. A full basketball talk. NBA, college, women's college. Hopefully this is enough to hold y'all over till y'all get to y'all, y'all games tonight. Um, as always, I appreciate everything. I want to know y'all feedback, concerns, whether you're a fan or a potential opponent of one of the five scariest teams I have heading into the playoffs. What's your thoughts? Is there a team out there that you fear that I didn't mention? If so, let me know and let me know why. As always, I hope y'all have an incredible week. I will see y'all next week. This is the Heliocentric Podcast. I am Pierre, PBD Plug, Andreessen. I'm out. Peace.